Good morning, everyone. This is Mike with the Macro Church of Christ. This is our Sunday Acts study. We're starting at Acts chapter 15 and verse 1. And remember that you can find most of our material on the macrochurchofchrist.org website. That's macrdcfc.org. Uh, or you can email me if you want to speak, speak directly to me uh, at the address there below. We've been looking at the book of Acts, and we've been looking at the apostle uh, Paul as he had finished his first missionary journey. In chapter 14, we noticed that he ended the journey by having a review with the activity that was done while he was away as he reported back to the church in Antioch. Uh, verse Acts 14, verse 26 says, And from there they sailed to Antioch, from which they had been commended to the grace of God for the work they had, they had accomplished. When they had arrived at and gathered the church together, they began to report all things that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And they spent a long time with the disciples. Now that's a really important statement, especially for the background for chapter 15, because it says that they reported the things that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles, because that's really going to be the discussion in chapter 15. And though... Uh, Cornelius was the first Gentile uh, household that we have um, who was converted. The success began, and others were converted, who, unlike Cornelius, may, might not have had as close of a connection with the Jewish communities as Cornelius did. Uh, and so there's going to be this discussion that's going to come up then about just exactly what does a Gentile have to do in order to have fellowship with God. And is he required to do everything that the law taught, and everything that the Christian Jews, sorry, Christian Jews, and many of, the, um, of them were still doing, and that is this idea of keeping the law. And so as he began, he, it says in Acts 15, and some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now I'm going to stop there for just a minute because there's a few things I want to say about this verse. Uh, number one, I want you to notice that it says some men came down from Judea. So uh, Paul is in Antioch because that's where he's at. Uh, that's where him and Barnabas ended up, and they stayed there for a long time. And while they're there, some men came down from Judea. Now remember when the Luke says down and up, it's not north and south. It simply means elevation, that they actually went down from Jerusalem into uh, Antioch, uh, but they came from Judea. Now that's important. Because what we're going to notice is, is that they're going to be going back to Judea. And the reason for that is because the men came from Judea. That's the reason they're going to go back to Judea. Uh, and not only that, but it says, And began teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And so they began to teach somebody what you had to do in order for you to be saved. They're not just saying, this is our opinion, or this is what we think uh, this is what we believe. They are saying you cannot do this or you cannot be saved unless you do these things. So there's a big difference between somebody saying, I uh, do something for God and then requiring other people to do it and saying that you must do it in order to be saved. That's the discussion that's under consideration. That, that's what this uh, chapter is going to be about. It's going to be about what does a person have to do in order to be saved in order for that individual to have a relationship with God. And notice that it also says, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses. Now, circumcision to a Jew wasn't just the idea of having the foreskin removed, but it's the idea of keeping a covenant. That's the idea. This was given over here in Genesis chapter 17, when God came to Abraham and told Abraham that he was making a covenant with him. Uh, he says in, in Genesis 17 and verse 10, This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be the sign of the covenant between me and you, that every male among you who is eight days old shall be circumcised through your generation. A servant who was born in the house or who was brought, bought with money from uh, any foreigner who is not of your descendants, 
A servant who is born in your house or who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. Thus shall my covenant be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. But an uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall, shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. And so there's the, the place where God spoke about the covenant that he gave them. Now, what I want you to notice is that he says this is a sign. Verse 11 says, And it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. Uh, as far as I can tell in the Old Testament, uh, the only people who were to be circumcised were the descendants of Abraham. Uh, and that would include then those individuals who, who followed next, and especially the children of Israel. Uh, they were commanded to be circumcised, and they were commanded to be circumcised on the eighth day. Now, this doesn't change the fact that God's plan for the world was to save people through Abraham. Matter of fact, in Romans chapter 4, it says God chose Abraham before he was circumcised to prove to the world that it's not those who are circumcised only who can be saved, but those who aren't circumcised. Now remember that circumcision to a Jew wasn't just the removal of the foreskin, but it was a proof or evidence that one was being faithful to the law or to the covenant of God. And so therefore the question arises, do Gentiles have to be circumcised and have the sign of the covenant that they had according to the custom of Moses? Uh, and there were some people who'd come up from Judea. And remember, Judea is where Jerusalem is. It is the, the uh, central religious sphere of the Jewish community. Uh, and it's also from where the church started. Uh, and the apostles were all Jews, and the first people that were converted were Jews. But then we start to see that a number of Gentiles come in, and so this discussion comes up. It says, some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And so that they went up and, and began to teach that. Now, verse 2 of Acts 15 says, And when Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with them, the brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and some others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders concerning this issue. Therefore, being sent on their way by the church, they were passing through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles, and were bringing great joy to all the brethren. When they arrived at Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who had believed stood up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the laws of the law of Moses. So here we have the, the, the background. It says that some Jews came up from Jerusalem and they began to teach this. Uh, I would suggest to you uh, that this is a different situation than what you have over here in Galatians chapter 2. In Galatians chapter 2, there was also individuals who came up to Antioch, and they also taught, or they, they taught this separation between Jews and Gentiles, Christians, uh, because, apparently that, uh, because apparently the Gentiles were not keeping uh, the Jewish customs and the dietary laws that were in the Old Testament. Now, I would suggest to you that this uh, incident is not the incident of Acts chapter 15, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in, in a, just a minute. But I would suggest to you that this incident right here actually happened over here in, in Acts chapter 11 when Peter uh, had, the, when, when the church in Antioch first started, and Peter went down to Jerusalem, uh, and, and he went down there by, by uh, revelation, and that I'd suggest to you that it's at this time that that happened. And But nonetheless, it still applies to what we're speaking about now. So let me go back to Galatians for just a minute and notice that is, uh, notice what the, what the problem is or the situation is because it's exactly the same thing that, that happened in Acts chapter 15. And so uh, here it says uh, in, in, in Galatians 2 and verse 11, it says, But when Cephas came, up, came to Antioch, I opposed him to the face because he stood condemned. Now, one of the reasons I believe this is different is because it says in Acts chapter 15 that the, that the uh, group 
that came up from Judea apparently did not include an apostle because it says that the reason they went down to Jerusalem to go talk to the apostles was because that, or to Jerusalem, was because that's where the apostles were. If this was a situation where uh, Paul, where Cephas was there, they would have said the other apostles because Cephas would have been with them going down. And so I want to suggest to you that this is not the same situation. Not only that, but also in this account in Acts chapter 15, there is no hesitation or no variance between Cephas and what Paul think, not at all. There is no conflict. There's no having to convince Peter or Cephas that he was, that he was mistaken and, and Paul is right. I'd suggest to you that this happened way back over in Acts chapter 11 or during that period there. But having said that, let's look at what this says in Galatians 2 and verse 11. He says, But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to the face, because he stood condemned. For prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. The rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy, with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in the presence of all, If you, being a Jew, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? Now, let's notice what's going on here. Apparently, Cephas would come up to Antioch, and he would be there probably teaching the brethren from time to time. And uh, while he was there at, at one of those times, it says in verse 21 that some, that some uh, uh, people from James, and by the way, James was in Jerusalem. Uh, that's where he was stationed. And so some in, men came and they said they were from James. And when they came up, uh, they saw that Peter had been eating with the Gentiles and communing with them in table fellowship. And they withdrew from the Gentiles because the Gentiles were probably not eating kosher food or, or pursuing the law as the, as the Jews would. And therefore, they separated from the Gentiles. And even, Paul, even Peter separated from the Gentiles. And it was such a sharp division that even Barnabas, for a time, separated from the, from the Gentiles. And so what you had then in Antioch, Uh, during this time was you had one group of Christians that were Jewish and another group of Christians that were Gentiles and they weren't uh, able to have table fellowship together. They weren't able to eat together because the Jewish Christians believed that the Gentile Christians were not observing everything that was necessary for their salvation and therefore they couldn't have fellowship with them. And it was so strong, this division was so strong that even Peter and Barnabas both of them went over and started associating with the Gentile, with the Jewish Christians and left the Gentile Christians to themselves. Now, it says in, in Galatians 2 and verse 14, but when I saw that the I is Paul, but when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, if you being a Jew live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? In other words, Paul, when he, not, when he noticed what was happening, Uh, Maybe he had been gone for a while or something, but when he came back and noticed that there were these two groups that weren't associating with one another, he then came to Peter and, and pointed out that Peter was a hypocrite because prior to these people who came from James, from Jerusalem, uh, and who claimed that they couldn't eat with the uh, Gentiles because they weren't eating kosher food, Paul, uh, Paul says to Peter, you were eating with them. Before those men showed up, you were eating with the Gentiles. You were having fellowship with the Gentiles. That's what he means when he says, if you being a Jew lived lived like the Gentiles and not like the Jews. In other words, when, when Peter was there, he was eating with them and acting like a Gentile and not necessarily following the customs of the Jewish law. Uh, and And Paul confronted him because now all of a sudden when the brethren from Judea or James came up uh, who made an issue about this rather than Peter or Cephas trying to convince them 
that they were mistaken and the Gentiles had full, full fellowship, he separated from them and went over to the, to the Jewish community of Christians and therefore uh, uh, had this schism or this division. And that's why he says, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? He says, you can't do both. You, you, Peter, you can't be living like the Gentiles and, and thinking you're okay with God, but then you have to convince the Gentiles that they have to live like Jews in order to, to be right. That, that doesn't work. Matter of fact, he goes on to say in Galatians 2 and 15, we are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ, and not by works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. And so uh, Peter, uh, Paul pointed out to Peter that uh, both Jews and both Gentiles are saved by faith. They're not saved by keeping law. They're saved by faith. That's how they're saved. Uh, they're saved by trusting in Jesus and following the risen Messiah, who is the Christ. A and that's uh, why Paul confronted Peter to his face. Now, you don't see any of that division. You don't see any of those problems over here in Acts chapter um, 15. There, there's no mention of a division between Barnabas and Paul. There's no men mention of Peter even being there. There's no mention of Peter and Paul having a disagreement. It says that, that brethren came up and there was this great debate. And notice that Barnabas was on Paul's side during this time. When that incident happened with, with Peter, Barnabas was on Peter's side until he was corrected by Paul. And so I suggest to you that this is a different uh, time period. Uh, and that's important because what that means is that issue had already been settled in the mind of what I would call the two most important apostles. That is, Paul, who was the apostle of the Gentile, and Peter, uh, who was the apostle of the, of the Jews, uh, or to the Jews. Uh, and it had been settled even before this discussion came up, and even before the real conversion of the Gentiles happened. Uh, but that's already, been, that's already happened. Now, in Acts 15 and verse 2, it says, and when Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with them, notice, notice that. It doesn't say Paul had a debate with Barnabas and them. It says Paul and Barnabas had a great dis dissension. See, in, in the incident with Peter, Barnabas was on Peter's side, and Paul had to correct both of them. But now you don't see that. You see the unity between Paul and Barnabas and that there is no hesitation on the part of Barnabas to be on Paul's side. And it says when Paul and Barnabas had, had great dissension and debate with them, the brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and some others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders concerning this issue. Now, one of the other things that I want you to notice here is that the brethren uh, it, it is in italics or is kind of um, um, uh, in small let, uh, in light letters here, that means it's, a, it's in italics, which means it's not in the original Greek, but pretty much we understand that somebody determined that Paul and Barnabas should, uh, and some others of them should go up to Jerusalem. And I'd suggest to you the reason they put the word brethren in there is because Paul has no need at all, and I don't think Barnabas did either, had no need at, at all of confirming the message that he preached. He already knew the message that he preached. Matter of fact, I would suggest to you that in Galatians chapter 2, the first part of Galatians 2, uh, when, when Paul went to Jerusalem the first time, that that's when the matter was settled, that the same thing that Paul taught is exactly the same thing that Peter taught. And that's why Peter and the, uh, and the apostles gave to Paul the right hand of fellowship that he should go to the Gentiles and Peter and the other apostles should go to to the Jews, and that they added nothing to Paul's message, and they took nothing away from Paul's message. Uh, and so that, that's what you have here. So the brethren, I would suspect, would be the people in um, Antioch who determined that Paul and Barnabas should, and some others notice, so it wasn't just Paul and Barnabas, but other brethren that were with them, should go down to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders concerning this issue. Now, one of the things I want you to notice is that they did not go to Rome. Now, why do I say that? Well, because today the Catholic Church uh, seems to have the idea that uh, 
the seat or the center of the religious world is in Rome uh, and at the Vatican. And that Rome is the place where all religious matters are to be discussed and, and remedied. But what I want you to notice is that's not where they went. In this, in this reading, you'll find no place where Rome was ever mentioned or anybody mentioned about calling the elders that were in Rome for this discussion. I would suggest to you that the reason that they went to Jerusalem was because that's from where the brethren came up. And no doubt they came up saying, this is what the, the apostles are teaching us down in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, the apostles are teaching us that we have to keep the law. And so therefore, the Gentiles have to keep the law. And if they don't circumcise themselves and their children and keep the law, then they cannot be saved. And I guarantee you that that's what the, these brethren were telling the people in Antioch. And so the people in Antioch, uh, even though they have Paul, they're going to go down and make sure uh, of uh, what should be taught and what should be under, under discussion. And it says, in some, others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders concerning this issue. Now, notice they went to the apostles and elders. And that's because the elders uh, that are in Jerusalem uh, are, are the people who are in charge of the church there. And therefore, they're the ones who would have sent the men up if the men are coming and saying, we came from the church in Jerusalem, and the church in Jerusalem is teaching this. Well, then you need to get the leaders of the church in Jerusalem uh, in order to answer this question. You're not going to go to some other church. You're not going to go to some church in Rome in order to answer this. You're going to go to the, to the church that from where the problem is springing up and springing out. But not, not only that, but they were going to the apostles because that's where we go to find the truth of God's word. And the apostles wrote the, the, the Bible and the inspired writers wrote the Bible so that we would have them and we still go to them today. If there's a problem or there's a situation, we don't go to a group of men somewhere and ask those group of men what to do. What we do is we go to the apostles. We go to their word, wherever we might be, whether in Rome or whether in Mexico or whether in the United States. Uh, if, there's a religious, um, if there's a religious matter that comes up, we don't have to run to some central headquarters. We run to the apostles, and the apostles were the ones who wrote the, the word of God. And that's why Jesus said those people who listen... To you, to the apostles, listen to me. If they listen to me, then they listen to the one who sent me. And so today we do the same thing. We still listen to the apostles, and so we go to the apostles. Now, it just so happened in that day and time, the apostles were living and alive, and they uh, 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 were in Jerusalem, and so that's the reason that they went there. Now, uh, along with that, uh, the, uh, somebody might say, well, the, the apostle is still uh, in, uh, in Rome today, and so that's why we go to Rome. Well, there's no place in the scripture where we have a succession of apostles after uh, uh, they died. There's no place where apostles were replaced one right after they died. Uh, James died, and there was no replacement for him. Um, uh, Paul died, there was no replacement for him. Uh, we have the apostles, uh, all, uh, those original apostles, and when they died, nobody replaced them. Uh, th there is not this replacement. Because the, one of the qualifications, according to Acts chapter 1, was they had to see Jesus. And nobody today has seen Jesus. So just wanted to point that out. Now, verse 3, it says, Therefore, so since they decided to go down to Jerusalem, or up to Jerusalem, remember that's talking elevation, that they went up to Jerusalem, therefore being sent, verse 3 says, therefore being sent on their way by the church. So it was the church who, who wanted this matter cleared up. Uh, I'm persuaded that Paul didn't need it cleared up. Barnabas didn't need it cleared up. They knew what the truth was, and Paul certainly knew what the truth was because he, because he was inspired and had already received the hand, the hand of fellowship from the apostles to the Jews. And so it was the church that decided to, to go up and take care of this matter or to verify this matter. And so it says, therefore, being sent on their way by the church, they were passing through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and were bringing great joy to all the brethren. So as they were passing through, as they were on their journey, no doubt they would go to, to the church or to the saints in order to stay there on their trip. And as they passed through, they explained to them how God was saving the Gentiles and the brethren were elated, they were excited. Uh, and rather, rather than them being judgmental, they were excited about the fact that God was bringing others into his kingdom. 
And, and, and so it says in verse 4, and when they arrived, uh, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders. And they reported all that God had done with them. So when they uh, arrived uh, at Jerusalem, they gathered together the leadership. The church received them, and the apostles were there, and the elders were there. So you have the, you have the church who the people that came up to Antioch claimed had sent them with this message. You have the apostles, which no doubt they also claimed were teaching them these things. And you had the elders, which no doubt they were saying we were sent by the elders in Jerusalem. And so you have those groups there represented because that's, that's who you go to whenever there's a matter that comes up and whenever somebody is teaching something that is causing pro people to have problems. You go to the people. You go to where they are so that they can clarify this for you. And it says, and they reported all that God had done with them. And so when they arrived, they, the apostles also told, uh, reported to the, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Peter and, uh, and Barnabas, no doubt reported to the apostles, the elders in the church, everything that God had been doing with them, the conversion of the Gentiles, the work going on in, in Antioch, uh, and, and the, the conversion of those Gentiles. Now, verse 5. But some of the sect of the Pharisees, who had believed stood up saying it is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the law of Moses. Now, here's the problem. And here, I'm sure, is where this issue started. It started with these Pharisees who become part of the church. It's always difficult to put away all of our preconceived ideas and, and all of our um, uh, attitudes that we had uh, when we first become a Christian. It sometimes takes a little bit of time for that to change, as it did with Peter. Peter, in Acts chapter 2 and verse uh, 39, said that the promise was for them and for, uh, for those who were far off, as many as the Lord our God would call. But it took Peter a little time to finally get it into his head. That was Galatians chapter 2. And so you can kind of understand these Pharisees who were very legalistic in their, in their approach and their view. Uh, and you can understand how they might say it is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the laws of Moses because they had been observing them and they were taught to observe them and they grew up observing them. And so when they became Christians, they weren't necessarily told stop observing them. Uh, you don't have to anymore. Matter of fact, many of the Jewish Christians continued to observe many of the things that they were doing. Um, Many of them even continued in the, in the temples with the ceremonies and the vows and those sacrifices that were in there. But nonetheless, you have these individuals who are saying that it's necessary to circumcise them. Now, them is the Gentiles. And to direct them, the Gentiles, to observe the law of Moses. So he's saying it's necessary that they are circumcised because circumcision is the sign of the covenant. It's the sign that's given to them that says that they are keeping the covenant. Now, the Romans chapter 2 has a great deal to say about the idea of circumcision and the idea of the covenant. He points out in Romans chapter 2 that, the, that circumcision isn't any good unless you keep the law. And so people who, don't, who aren't circumcised but who keep the law, they're just as good as the people who are circumcised and keep the law. Uh, and so circumcision really isn't the issue. It's the sign. It's what it points to. It's supposed to point to people being faithful to God and faithful to the covenant. Now, uh, the covenant that's under consideration here, as you re as you can see this, is to observe the laws of Mo the law of Moses. A and what that means is those laws that God gave Moses for a national people, and and that's what they're that's what they're discussing. They want to make the Gentiles into proselytes. They want to make them into religious Jews. Uh, and that's basically what a proselyte is. A proselyte becomes and starts to follow a certain way of thinking, a certain way of doing things. And therefore, they become, though they're not nationally or physically um, that way, they, they're considered as part of the group. Uh, and so that's what's in their considerations. Now, that's, that's the question that's, that needs to be uh, asked. 
Is it necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the law of Moses? Now, verse 6. And the apostles and the elders came together to look into this matter. So here you notice that, they're, that the apostles are going to look into this matter, and they're going to be discussing it and talking about it. Now, verse 7. It says, After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brethren, you know that in, in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the hearts, testified to them, giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he also did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you put God to the test by placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor, nor we have been able to bear. But we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they also are. And so here's Peter's uh, uh, rebuttal or Peter's answer as this discussion is going on. And, and you can imagine the discussion that's going on about the Gentiles having to keep the, the circumcision uh, because the Jews had been keeping it for so long. And so that's why it says in verse 7, after there had been much debate, so they allowed them to debate, they allowed them to, to bring out their arguments, and then it says that Peter stood up and said to them, now, why Peter? Well, let me suggest to you that Peter is a central figure here, not because he is a pope, but because he is the one who we have uh, preaching to the Jews in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, it says, when the eleven stood up, by the way, all eleven were speaking, but we have Peter's uh, um, sermon, verse 14, says, but Peter taking his stand with the eleven. So all twelve of the apostles were there, and all twelve of them were standing and speaking. Remember, they're speaking in tongues, and so they're each speaking a different language. And so we have Peter's account, and Peter raised his voice and declared. And so he begins to tell the Jewish community, which is why he's being discussed over here in Acts 15, the Jewish community, men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem. And so he preaches to them, and basically what he preaches to them is that this Jesus is the Christ. That's his conclusion in verse 36. Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom he crucified. Now, what, what did he tell them to do in order to be saved? Well, here's what he told them in, in verse 37. Or verse 37, excuse me, they asked Peter what they should do. It says, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what should we do? So this is the Jewish community, the very first Jewish group of people who hear the gospel preached, and they're asking Peter what to do. And verse 38 says, and Peter said to them, repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now notice that it mentions nothing about keeping the law of Moses. It doesn't mention a single thing about keeping the law of Moses. It doesn't mention a single thing about circumcision. And somebody might say, well, they were already doing that. Yes, but if that was necessary, he would have told them to continue doing that. But he didn't. What he told them was that they need to repent, I mean, turn their life around, uh, and, and recognize their sin and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ to have their sins forgiven uh, and that they would receive what the Holy Spirit promised, the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is salvation. And that's why it says down here in Acts chapter 2 uh, and, and verse 40, it says, And with many other words he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Now, they had already been keeping the law. They were Jews. They had already been circumcised. But he says they're not saved. He says they're not in a saved relationship yet. Well, how does that saved relationship happen? Verse 41 says, So then those who had received his word were baptized. And that day there was added about 3,000 souls. And, to what, and when he says added, what does that mean? Well, verse 47 says, And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. So when those individuals received the message of the Lord Jesus, were baptized in his name, they then were saved. Uh, and they were saved from this evil generation. 
and Peter did not tell them, and make sure that you continue faithful to the laws of Moses. He didn't say that. Uh, that's not what he taught them. Now, he mentions Peter also because Peter was the first one to preach the, the, the message to the Gentile community. And that was in the, to the household of Cornelius over here in Acts chapter 10. Uh, and we're not going to go through all of this, but I just want you to notice the message that he preaches to the Gentiles. Uh, he, he starts off here in uh, Acts 10 and verse 34 and says, Opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. So Peter now comes to understand after uh, God appeared to him in the vision of the sheet that was let down all those animals, and Peter said that he wouldn't eat anything unclean, and God said to him, don't call anything clean that God is cleaned or that God says is okay. Uh, and so he says, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome with him. So it says he has to fear God, and he has to do the right things. He, he has to live righteously. Now, coming down here to verse 42, it says, And he ordered us, the apostles, to preach the, to the people, and solemnly to testify that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. Of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sin. So notice again, it says those who believe him receive forgiveness of sins. Now, do you remember how those people in Acts 2 uh, um, proved that they believed the message? They repented and they were baptized, weren't they? Well, over here it says in verse 47 in Acts 10, it says, Surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did, can he? And he ordered them to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, then they asked him to stay on for a few days. So the same exact message that Peter preached to the Jewish community for the way people were going to be saved is the exact same message that Peter preaches to the Gentile community. And that's the reason why his, discussion, uh, his testimony is so important. And that's why in, ver in Acts 15 and verse 7 it says, After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brethren, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. So, what was required uh, of them? Peter said, I preached to them. I'm the first ones who, who preached, brethren, uh, uh, to them. Uh, and that, that he preached to the Gentiles. He said, my mouth preached to the Gentiles. Well, what he preached to the Gentiles? He preached to the Gentiles the gospel and that they had to believe it. Well, what's the good news? Well, the good news is, there's, is that we have a new king and that king is the Messiah that David was promised and he's sitting at the right hand of God and he's, his kingdom is here and he's in control of everything and therefore, if you want to accept him, then you needed to be baptized after repenting of your sins and being baptized, acknowledging uh, that you recognize his death, burial, and resurrection, uh, and then you're raised up to walk in newness of life. And that's how you believe. Now, believe always has action to it. We're supposed to have action to the things that we believe. Even the thief on the cross had action to his faith. He didn't just uh, we don't just have a record of it saying he believed him and did nothing. The thief on the cross believed God and confessed that he believed God and no doubt repented and changed his, his um, attitude because he told the other robber that we are being uh, condemned justly. He's recognizing his own guilt and his own sin, and, and that's what we call uh, a confession of sins or repentance, and then he turns to Jesus and recognizes that Jesus is the Messiah and asks him to remember him in his kingdom. So even the thief on the cross had action that accompanied his belief, and so here the Gentiles do too. And we saw what that action was in the case of the Gentiles, and that was that Peter commanded them to be baptized in water uh, in order for them to be saved. Now, verse 8, it says, And God who knows the heart, testified to them, giving them the Holy Spirit just as he also did to us. 
and he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Now, I want you to notice what he says here. The reason Peter, the reason Peter baptized them was not just because Peter thought they should be, but it says because the Holy Spirit testified to them or testified for them or through or, or about them, testified to them, giving them the Holy Spirit. Now, how, how did Peter know they had the Holy Spirit? Could you see it? Well, well sometimes you can, but, but more than likely it's because they began to speak in tongues. And, and they began to speak, and I believe they began to speak in Hebrew, because the people that came with Peter were Hebrews, and the Gentile wouldn't know Hebrew. And if the Gentiles were, were speaking French or some other language, the, the uh, uh, people that were with Peter, they wouldn't know if they were gi- uh, saying gibberish or not. But if they were speaking Hebrew, then they would know that the Holy Spirit has them, and they would see the similarities between that and Acts chapter 2, where the Holy Spirit had the apostles speaking in tongues prior to them being saved, prior to the, to the uh, uh, Jews receiving uh, the message of salvation. And that's what you have going on in Acts chapter 10. And it says, and so verse 8 says, And God, who knows the heart, testified to them, giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he also did to us. You see, in Acts chapter 2, they received the Holy Spirit to prove that they could be saved and to prove that the Messiah was ruling and reigning. In Acts chapter 10, the, the Holy Spirit came down and ascended on the Gentile community to prove the very same thing, that they could be saved because Jesus was ruling and reigning. And that's why it says, just as he also did to us. So Peter is important because Peter is preaching the exact same message to both Jews and Gentiles as to how to be saved. That's why verse 9 says, And he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. There it is. You see, the Gen- the Jewish community was also saved by faith faith. They were saved not because they kept the law. If they were saved because they kept the law, then they didn't have to believe in Jesus. They didn't need Jesus. But if they understood that they were sinners, and if they understood that they hadn't been keeping the law, and if they understood that they needed somebody to die for them, and that's what the sacrifices were about, then they would be individual who would be looking forward to the coming of the Messiah, and they now understand that that would be Jesus. And that's why in the rest of Galatians chapter 2, and down here at verse uh, 16, it says, Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus. Now, here's what I want us to understand. In the Greek, the word the is not in the original. It's just by the works of law. You see, he says, nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by works of law. You see, the reason I I want you to understand that is because this idea of the law of Moses isn't just about the law of Moses. It's about law in general. It's about the fact that that man has never been saved by law-keeping. Never. He's never been saved by it. A matter of fact, Galatians 3 says that if man could have kept the law, God would have been based on law. But man couldn't keep it. And no matter how many people tell you that individuals were keeping it, they were keeping it from the standpoint of that they were doing what it said even when they sinned. But is that really keeping the law? If you sinned, there was a remedy for that in the Old Testament. They were called the animal sacrifices. And so when it says that somebody in the New, in the New Testament, or even the Old Testament, kept the law, That's not implying that they kept God's law perfect. What that's implying is is that they kept the law of Moses perfect, and and they kept the law of Moses that required them that when they break the law, that they should offer a sacrifice. And since they were doing that, they were keeping the law, but they weren't keeping what you and I would call the letter of the law. And nobody has kept the letter of the law except for Jesus. Jesus. He never needed a sacrifice. He never needed to ask forgiveness. He never needed to repent. Jesus kept the law. 
but perfectly. Now, Galatians 2.16 says, Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by works of law, but through faith in Christ Jesus. Well, why is it that a man can't be justified by works of law? Because we all sinned. If you don't believe me, look at Romans 3, uh, uh, 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Re read the whole uh, beginning of, cha of chapter 3 uh, and notice that he says that the Old Testament even teaches that there's none righteous. No, not one. Not a single one is righteous. So sometimes people will say, well, well, it says that some people kept the law. Well, that's in the context of people who sin and there was a remedy in the law. That's that context. It's not that they lived flawlessly. Uh, so those people who make those statements are making it out of context. But verse 16 says, Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus. Now, when he says even we, he's talking about the Jews. Paul is saying we Jews who keep the law. We know we haven't kept it good enough to be saved. We know that we're sinners. We know that we needed sacrifices. We know that we needed blood atonement. We know that we needed the, the, day, the, the, uh, the day of atonement that was represented in, in the lamb that was offered once a year that reminded us of our sin and the payment that needed to be made. He says, uh, and so even we have believed in Christ Jesus. He says, uh, that the Jews who keep the law, they believe in Christ Jesus. Why? So that we, the Jews, may be justified by faith in Christ. You see, that's how we're justified. We're just by, justified by faith in Christ, not by keeping law, and not by the works of law. There it is. Since, ready? By the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. So anybody who says to you that they're getting to heaven because they're su such good Christians, or they're getting to heaven because they're keeping all the laws, doesn't understand the Christ, doesn't understand the gospel. And, and I'd suggest to you that they don't understand the elements of the Lord's Supper, which the New Testament church partook regularly, uh, weekly, uh, so, so that they would be reminded of the fact that it's not by their religious and righteous activity that they get to heaven, but by the death of, of the Word of God that came down to this world and became flesh and died to pay for our sins so that God would be able to accept this into the fellowship of his kingdom. And so it says, since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in, uh, no, no flesh will be justified by works of the law. Since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. Sorry, I read that a little wrong, but you, you get the point. That's what's under discussion over here in Acts chapter 15. That's what's happening here. And that's why Peter is the one who's speaking and talking and pointing out that here's what God did with him. Here, here's the message that he's teaching and, and that he's preaching. And so it says uh, in Acts 15 and verse 9, back to Peter's uh, little sermon, it says, and he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their heart by faith. So God said there's no distinction. You know, we have to remember that. We have to remember that there's no distinction because we're saved by faith. And sometimes that means that some people who believe something a little bit different than we might, or who see, see things a little bit different than we might, God has the ability to save them. And that some people who are doing things that I might not think are good, God has the ability to save them. Because he's not saving them by, by keeping of law. He's saving everybody by faith. And I'm thankful that he saves everybody by faith. Because that means I have a, a good chance of getting there. Because all of us who are going to be saved are going to be saved by faith. We're going to be saved by trusting God. And again, does that mean there's nothing to do? Of course not. We just pointed out what the uh, Jews did. And we pointed out what the Gentiles did. But nowhere did he say that they had to keep the law of Moses. They had to believe in Jesus. And so if Jesus wants you to keep the law of Moses, then keep it. If Jesus doesn't want you to keep the law of Moses, then you don't have to keep it. And, and that's, that's what's going on here. Some of the Jewish uh, Christians, since they've been accustomed to keeping the law of Moses, they're continuing to keep it. And they can, but that's not what's saving them. What's saving them is they're is their trusting in Jesus. And the Gentile community that ne never really has kept the uh, laws of Moses, uh, 
they can be saved without keeping the laws of Moses. But they have to keep those uh, laws that God requires of them, that, that the Messiah requires of them. Now, verse 10. He says, now, therefore, here's the conclusion. Here's Peter's conclusion. Since both Jews and Gentiles are saved by faith, since God put no distinction between them, since God gave both of them the witness of the Holy Spirit, and since both groups did exactly the same thing in order to get right with God, he says, now, therefore, why do you put God to the test by placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear. You see, I think right here, and maybe before this, Peter now understands that the law was never given for the purpose of saving them. That the law was given to them for the purpose of teaching them two things, how to love God and how to love people. And that they have not done that perfectly. And so therefore, it became a yoke to them and a burden to them. And, and that's what Romans chapter 7 is about. Romans chapter 7 is about the fact that the law which was meant for good turned out to be an opportunity for sin. And so rather than it becoming a, uh, a way for them to be free, it became a yoke and a burden, and they were yoked to the law. They owed the law, and the law was pulling them along as sinners until... Jesus came along. And so that's what he means here. And that's what Jesus meant, by the way, in John chapter 8, when he says, you shall know the truth, the truth will make you free. And then the Jews said, we don't need to be free. I mean, we don't, uh, we're not slaves. We don't need to be made free. We, we haven't been slaves of anybody. And Jesus said to them, those who sin are slaves of sin. See, the problem is, is they didn't understand that they were sinners. But right here, Peter is affirming that they were, that all of them were, every single one of them was a sinner. I think it's interesting that when the children of Israel were going to enter into the promised land, that Moses, who stood for the law, who stood for teaching the law and following the law, and, in, and God says that, that he was faithful in all his house, but yet he wasn't allowed to enter in. He wasn't allowed into the promised land. And you know why? Because he sinned. And we only have the record of one sin that he committed. He committed one sin. And that had to do with the bringing forth of water. So the children of Israel, uh, when they were thirsty. But because he sinned, God said, you can't go in it. You can see it, but you can't go in it. And that suggests to you that Moses is an example of what the law does. The law teaches us about the promised land. The law helps us look into the promised land. But through the law, we don't get in the promised land. Now, what's interesting is, is you know who took them into the promised land? Joshua. You know what Joshua's name is in Greek? Jesus. Jesus took them into the promised land. And they had to follow Jesus or Joshua in order to get into that promised land. And so I'd suggest to you that that's what is being pictured here as well, that the Jews, and for that matter, any person has never kept the law except for Jesus, good enough where God is going to save them because they're such wonderful people. Now, verse 10, therefore, why do you put God to the test by placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that we are saved through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, of our Lord Jesus, in the same way as they also are. So how did Peter say both Jews and Gentiles were saved? By grace. That's how. By grace. Neither one of them earned it. So you can't put a law on a, on a group of people and say you have to do this to be saved. Because we don't, we're not saved because we earn it. We're not saved because we do everything perfectly. We're saved because we're believing and trusting in the work of Jesus that he has done for us. And that's why Peter's conclusion is, but we believe, we, the Jews, believe that we, we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they also 
are. And that's hard for religious people to believe. Because often we believe that we're saved because we have the truth and we got it all right and we're doing it all right. And that's the reason we're getting to heaven and that's the reason why some religious groups aren't. And don't misunderstand me. There are things that God says you have to, you have to believe Jesus is the Son of God. You have to believe that Jesus is the Lord. You, you have, there are certain things about Jesus but you, that you have to believe, but you have to believe them. And so Gentiles, according to Peter, were never commanded to keep the law of Moses in order to be saved. And that's where we're going to stop. Thanks for being here. Pray the Lord blesses you and continues to watch over you and to care for you as you learn and study more about him and depend on 